Good morning. Welcome on this beautiful Palm Sunday. Um, one one uh, housekeeping thing. Um, sometimes I transpose numbers. Hymn number 728 in your bulletin is actually 782. Right numbers, wrong order. Do we have any other announcements to share? Our beautiful flowers are from Kathy Miner's service on Monday. Um, Madeline's service will be on the 18th. Um, and visit, uh, service is at 11, visitation is at 10. And it'll all be here at the church. There's still pecans to buy. This is pecan month. They're healthy. So be sure you buy a case or two. Right? <laughs> Any other announcements to share? Then let us turn our hearts and minds to God. <coughs> Please stand and join me in our call to worship. It is holy to gather. It is holy to, sing. It is holy to be generous, to throw our coats on the road. It is holy to celebrate justice. It is holy to shout Hosanna. It is holy to remember. It is holy to gather. Here and now, let us do all those things. Holy God, sometimes life feels like a parade rushing by us as we stand on the sidelines and try to not miss it. There are hundreds of things that catch our eyes, but the things we fear missing the most is you. So slow down the speed of this parade, paint the colors of this world with a little bit brighter tone, and dance through the words in our scripture passage until it is impossible for us to miss you there. God, we are here. We are trying to pay attention. Gratefully we pray, amen. <laughs>
Please be seated. The word Hosanna is often sung with joy and glee on this day. We process in, we wave our palm branches, and it feels like a celebration, right? But the truth is, the word Hosanna actually means save us. The people along the parade route those 2,000 some years ago were crying for Jesus, for Jesus' help because they knew that this world is not as it should be. There is still much hurt out there. They were crying, save us. In the prayer of confession, we have our own Hosanna moment because we cry out to God, admitting the ways in which we have fallen short and we ask uh, for God's saving hand. So friends, let us pray together for there is still much hurt here. God of street parades and hosannas, to speak up for love and to speak hope to fear. We worry that we'll say the wrong thing. We worry that we'll offend. We worry that we'll speak up and won't be heard. And meanwhile, the parade marches on. Unravel our fears, speak conviction in us. Give us the courage to yell, Hosanna. Greatly we pray. Amen. Even when we are silent, even when we are scared, even when we miss the moment, even when we choose to speak and say the wrong thing, we still belong to God. There is nothing said or unsaid, done or undone, that can outdo that. So rest in this good news. Today there are two Bible passages I will be reading. The first will be The first will be Psalm 118. Verses 19 through 29. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. 
Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. The second passage is from Luke 19, verses 28 through 40. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Say, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, and joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. This is the word of the Lord. I gotta plug my fan in. It's hot up here. <sighs> That's better. So Friday, Friday, as I drove down Highway 30 from Ankeny to Tacoma, Nebraska. I passed a couple of homes that proudly flew what appeared to be a flag of the United States of America. Except they contain the words F. Biden. Now, I really don't care what people's political views are, but there is a word that is not only inappropriate, and I'm not talking about the word Biden, but certainly not something that should be displayed on the United States flag, either inside or outside of our homes, where children can see it. You know, those same children that some are declaring should not be given access to books in school libraries that contain those type of words. And again, I'm not talking about the word Biden. I wondered, as I was driving, how Jesus would feel about that kind of a flag about the drive for cameras in classrooms and banning books that make us uncomfortable. Indeed, would that not also include the Bible? Continuing my drive, my thoughts turn to a Facebook post that John Dorhauer, General Minister of the United Church of Christ, had 
posted earlier on Friday. John wrote, my day started out like any other. I'm needing to drive six hours to a synod planning meeting. Mimi, Mimi's his wife, is with me. She's now driving. On the drive, I met by phone with a pastor whose church is now under threat because they chose to sing hymns during Lent written by racial minorities. They are calling it their Lent fast from whiteness. They are currently averaging five hate calls a minute on their voicemail. I also got this text from the president of the Unitarian Universalist Association. We talk every month or so just to find mutual support in the work we do. Her text read, I just got a call from the Trevor Project legal director. Last night, Alabama added additional amendments to their anti-trans legislation. It includes felonies with up to 10 years in prison for doctors providing, providing trans-affirming health care and the forced outing of trans kids. They are asking for heads of denominations to make strong commendation statements as part of the veto campaign aimed at the governor. Our PR director is working on a statement from me. Would you be willing to make a statement and ask others if they are willing? So now that Mimi is driving, I'm working to ensure we're heard on this matter as well. Meanwhile, I opened up an email that informed me that Ohio is now introducing don't say gay legislation in this state. And he goes on to say, this is our America and our United Church of Christ. We cannot and will not be silent in the face of these injustices. Racism, transphobia, homophobia, we fight it all. With and in love, we daily confront the injustices of our day. We will not stop preaching love until the hatred ends and all God's children are loved, are safe, and honored because of who they are. Just another day in the life of the United Church of Christ seeking to fulfill its purpose, namely, the to love the Lord our God with our whole heart, soul, mind, strength, and our neighbor as ourself, and seeking to fulfill our vision to use that love to build a just world for all. And as that came to mind, I thought, on this day that we call Palm Sunday, the beginning of the most sacred time in the Christian faith, this is what Jesus was talking about when he said, even the stones would cry out. Because books can be banned and ridiculous laws can be passed. But that's not going to silence God. In her sermon on Luke 19, 19 through uh, 40, actually, Stephanie Perdue wrote, the biblical landscape is a stony one. Traversing it, one is amazed that it produces enough sustenance for the sheep and goats that graze on it and the people who inhabit it. The stones of the biblical landscape have heard the cries and laments and received the tears of those who trod through them through the centuries. They have been picked up and hurled at others in an attempt, often, to silence or shame them. The stones are still lobbied to, lobbed today, and the stones still cry out. They cry for what they have witnessed, and they cry for themselves and the earth in which they are embedded and from which they have formed. They cry out with us and for all of us as we all await the coming of the Lord who renews the face of the earth. 
See, I think most of us have forgotten, if we ever knew, really knew, what Holy Week and really Jesus is about. I kind of like the statement that Rachel Keefe wrote in her message, Shouting Stones, a sermon for Palm Sunday. She said, you know, Jesus risked everything to remind us that life is about more than any individual. And we have a responsibility to love our neighbors into liberation. So that means that faith, our faith, is not a passive faith. It's not a fear-based, it's not to be fear-based and we're not to be pressured to be saved. And yet, as John Dorhauer noted, so much of legislation occurring in several states right now is attempting to make ours a passive faith built on fear. We forget. We forget that when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he did so to face that fear, to face the anger and the hatred that poured forth from those who objected to his love of neighbors into liberation stance. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he did so knowing that he probably wouldn't leave Jerusalem, at least not alive, because he knew that when we fear that which we don't understand, when we fear cries of justice and love, we go to great lengths in our attempts to silence those. And yet that didn't stop Jesus from continuing to speak out, even when he was faced with death, because he knew that even if he couldn't, even if those who journeyed with him became silent, that God would find a way to be heard. Not by flags that wave words of hate or laws that attempt to silence those who cry out for justice, but by the very stones, the stones that are of God. And folks, God cannot and will not be silenced. So may we be those stones in this holiest of weeks and in each day of our lives. Those who wish, please stand and join me in our affirmation of faith. Go to the village ahead of you, and you will find a colt tied there. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks, say, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and Jesus put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. The whole crowd of disciples began joyfully praising God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Mm -hmm. 
I tell you, Jesus replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Please be seated. Let us come together in prayer. Jesus, as the apostles went to get that colt, we wonder, 
Did you have to psych yourself up? As you rounded the corner to enter the gates, did you think, you know, this is really going to suck? When people threw their cloaks, did you focus on the children and try to think of how real their joy was? Did you laugh on Palm Sunday? Did you steal your victory moment because it was in peace? Did you think about unions and Black Lives Matter and trans kids and all the unnamed saints who through the generations live quietly? Did they all flash before your eyes when you sighed and took a deep breath to continue your march into Jerusalem? Did a tear of weariness and joy trickle down your face at the end of the day? Did you rub your forehead and smell the remnants of nard and remind yourself that you too were beloved after a full and important day? You know, Jesus, the longer I live, the more human you become. The more I see how you took on flesh for us so that our emotions are real to you, real and valid. Thank you for celebrating Palm Sunday with us. Thank you for its flashes of joy and humility and peace. Thank you for all the lives that have been a part of ours. And whose passings we now mourn. Pour out your love, O oh God. This we pray as we join together in the words taught to us by our Lord and Savior. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hosanna to the God who loves us, who heals us, who calls us to give of ourselves for the sake of the world. Hosanna in the highest. This is a time to gather our gifts together and offer them to God. And we do that for the sake of the world. Let us join together in our doxology. these gifts be used to bring healing, wholeness, and joy to the world God so dearly loves. Amen. Remember, 782.
day of Holy Week long ago, people throughout Judea arrived at the dusty gates of Jerusalem, primed with Hosanna in their hearts, and Jesus asked to borrow a donkey. On the Thursday that followed, Jesus rented or was given John Mark's mother's upper room to celebrate the Passover with the disciples. Gathered in sanctuaries, kitchens, living rooms throughout the earth, let us today ask God's blessing upon the bread and cup that makes us one. Gentle Redeemer, send your spirit of love and life power and blessing upon every table where your children gather. We remember that Paul the Apostle wrote letters to congregations throughout places we know called Greece, Turkey, and Macedonia. And they were the first remote worship spaces. The communion words sent to the church at Corinth were these, for I received from the Lord what I also handed to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf, and when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat and drink this bread and drink this cup, Proclaim the Lord's death until it comes. We are one in Christ. The bread we share. Let us, in our many places, receive the gift of God, the bread of heaven. And we are one in Christ in the cup we share. So let us, in our many places, receive the gift of God, the cup of blessing.
Let us pray in thanksgiving for this meal of grace, rejoicing that at the very method of our worship, we have embodied the truth that Christ's love is not limited by buildings made with human hands nor contained in human ceremonies, but blows us free as a spirit in all places. Spirit of Christ, you have blessed our tables and our lives. May the eating of this bread give us courage to speak faith and act love, not only in church sanctuaries, but in your precious world. May the drinking of this cup renew our hope. Wrap your hopeful presence around all whose bodies, spirits, and hearts need you. And let us become your compassion and safe refuge. Amen. <laughs> the beauty of this world. And in all of our living and our breathing and our being, of the lover, the beloved, and love itself go in peace, full 